the shores of Nova Scotia to the rocks of Newfoundland to the streets of Quebec City I'll be your wandering man from the Gulf Stream of St. Lawrence out to the prairie song up in the Rocky Mountains I'll be wandering on I'm wandering on I'm wandering on singing your song I'm wandering my way, or should I say struggling my way, to Prince Albert National Park in central Saskatchewan. I've come here in search of the story of Grey Owl, the famed author and conservationist who moved to the park in the early 1930s in an effort to save Canada's national symbol, the beaver, from extinction. Well, it looks like the beaver aren't doing too bad at Prince Albert National Park today, so why don't you come with me and let's go on a pilgrimage to Adjawan. Come on. Gray Owl was one of Canada's first pioneers of the conservation movement. According to his own words, he was a child of a Scottish father and an Apache mother. But shortly after his death, doubts about his real identity began to appear. And it soon was discovered that a native Indian gray owl was no other than Archibald Stansfield Bellaney, an Englishman who was born in September 1888 in Hastings, England. To help me figure out this fascinating story, I met with Donald Smith, author of From the Land of Shadows, The Making of Grey Owl. We started our conversation talking about the childhood of Archie Bellaney. Archie uh, was abandoned by his father and his, his mother, by the way, her name was Kitty. And so he was raised by two maiden aunts, the Mrs. Bellaney. Uh, very, Mrs. Bellaney, very Victorian individuals, never, of course, had raised children, didn't know how to raise a young boy, and young Archie was a hellion, so they had their hands full. How did he become Grey Owl? Archie Blaney came to Canada in 1906, landed in Halifax, he was age 17, and he becomes Grey Owl when he decides he's going to become Grey Owl. He started very early to say this story. I've got it recorded in 19, about 1911, 12, and told this story about his origins. That is, his father was a scout with Buffalo Bill, his mother was an Apache. He had it, he really had this one developed really well. He served in World War I and uh, was wounded in the foot, came back pretty discouraged by civilization, uh, really was ready to give it all up, um, didn't know what to do, and they really adopted him. I, I think you can certainly say that. They, they just let him come with them trapping and taught him the Ojibwe language, and he lived with them for about two years. And he learned the language, he could speak it. Who was Anna Hario and how did she enter into Grey Owl's life? Anna Hario is the real love of his life. What is very important to get across is that this guy confused misfit and all. Thanks to Anna Hario, straightens out his life. He, he, he gets a mission, he's got a writing gift, and he goes for it. He knows what the problem is, it's the same problem today. We're abusing the environment. How is he going to get that across? Well, he's got his little story about it being a North American Indian that seems so appropriate for this role that he's chosen. People pay attention. But his deal, and I'm totally convinced of this, is totally genuine. There's no masquerade. He genuinely was concerned about the environment. In his book, Pilgrims of the Wild, which is without any doubt, in my opinion, the best written book of the lot, he tells about his life as a trapper and how he he's converted to become a conservationist. Mm -hmm and to protect, work to protect the beaver rather than destroy them. It's sort of a very, very um, transformation kind of book and it's very well written. If Grail was alive today in, in, the, in the 21st century, what would be his message for, for the world? Well, I bet it's the same as it was then. 
you belong to nature. Nature does not belong to you. I wandered into the town of Waskasu. There, I went to a place that was connected with all things Grey Owl, the Friends of the Park bookshop. To my astonishment, inside the shop, I found a recreation of Grey Owl's cabin. It didn't take me long to find one of the activists behind the recreation, Grit McCree. She started our conversation by telling me about the Friends of the Park organization. The Friends of the Park in Prince Albert National Park are a group of volunteers who are dedicated to promoting stewardship in the park. Um, we like to promote educational services in the park for kids and just support Parks Canada, basically. You've been coming to Prince Albert all your life. Can you tell us about that and why? I think I've been coming to this park for over 30 years. I uh, grew up in Saskatoon and it's one of the main national parks in this province and you just get to love this place. I, I can't remember a summer that I haven't come here and our children have grown up here. I think anyone you talk to in this town site will tell you that it's a wonderful place and a great place to spend your summer. What do you love about the park? Oh boy, I love the stories. One of the things I love is the Grey Owl story, thus this project. I love canoeing, going out in the backwoods, just like the small community, we live in a big city, and so it's lovely to come here and just spend the summer with a few hundred people rather than, you know, thousands and thousands. You, you have a project, you've recreated Grail's cabin. Can you tell us about that? Oh, I'm so happy to tell you about that. Last summer, the Friends of the Park held their annual general meeting, and we had a little bit of money tucked away. It was, uh, it had been raised by the Grail Nature Trust and we talked about what we might do with that in light of the fact that Saskatchewan was celebrating a special birthday and we wanted to do something in the park for Grey Owl and so we, uh, we came up with this brilliant idea to make a replica of the inside of Grey Owl's cabin right here in the bookstore. We worked from uh, archival photos that Parks Canada supplied. We have some articles that are actually Grey Owl's and then a lot of these we just found to match the photographs. Can you point out some things to us here and tell us about them? Um, well, I guess sort of the feature is the war bonnet. Grail had a number of them that he used for his speaking tours overseas and in uh, across Canada. Um, let's see, we've got uh, an old Hudson's Bay blanket, typical of the times. He actually moved into this cabin in the 30s. It was built for him by Parks Canada. and. Um, just some of the books he read at the time. What's Happening at Midnight, just a number of books from, from the 30s. And of course, buckskin. He had wonderful buckskin jackets and uh, tobacco pouches and money belts made uh, with wonderful beadwork on it. This is the recreation of the beaver dam. And actually, Grail had this dam right in his cabin, just as it is here, because we worked from the archival photographs. And they had free run of his cabin. And we actually had the mud trail from the door to their uh, beaver lodge. And they were just in and out, um, just as if they were the children of the home. <laughs> so this is their beaver lodge, which takes up a good chunk of his, his, his cabin, actually. If you were recommending that someone come here for a visit, what would be some of the highlights? Where would you send them? Ooh, I think one of the first places I'd send them is on a canoe trip uh, into Ajuan to see Grail's cabin. After the interview, while looking at the exhibits there, I was thinking if I should go and see Grail's cabin, as suggested by Grit. But from what she had told me, it wasn't going to be an easy trip. I, I couldn't make up my mind. While looking at Grey Owl's autograph book, I became certain I had to do it. But my indecision had taken some time, so by the time I was ready to go, it was already late. And I decided to go on my adventure 
first thing in the morning. At the break of dawn, I started my pilgrimage to the cabin of the famed Canadian author and conservationist Archie Bellini, known to the world as Grey Owl. This was definitely not an easy trip. It is a journey across Kingsmere Lake by canoe or a long hike by the Backpackers Trail. Although it started out as a rainy day, by noon, it was already a beautiful, not too cold, not too hot, perfect summer day. Gazing into the crystal clear waters of Kingsmere River, I saw thousands of little minnows swimming underneath my canoe. And I found myself imagining Grey Owl paddling through these same peaceful waters, just as I was doing it now, more than 70 years later. A few hours later, I could see Kingsmere Lake, where at the shore, my guide Scott Nesbitt was waiting for me. Scott quickly tied both of our canoes together, preparing them for portaging. Then we put our canoes on the rail car portage, tied them to it securely, double checking all the knots to avoid any accidents. And off we went. Contrary to my expectations, using a rail car portage was not easy. But it's a known fact that a good conversation can make any hard job easier. So I started talking to Scott. Well, Scott, they call this the rail car portage. That's Seems correct. a bit uphill right now. We are heading uphill. Uh, that's correct. The, the rail car portage was built in the late 20s to make recreational access to Kingsmere Lake easier. Um, and it, there was a whole process involved. They actually cut off a kilometer of river by dig, digging a channel directly to Waskasu Lake. They installed 500 meters of rail car portage, and they inserted a dam to flood part of the river to make it deeper to, to put your boat in. This interesting discussion helped us to more easily reach our destination on the other side. Down the river. Yeah, we'll see you upstream. Okay. Ten minutes later, I was already back in my canoe and paddling away to Grey Owl's cabin. The surrounding wilderness was beautiful, and being in a canoe far away from civilization, I felt as close to nature as ever. Now, if I could only steer a canoe, it would have been an even greater experience. Now, what's next? Well, next we've got to just make our way down the beach about uh, 100 meters or so. There's the beginning of the portage into Ajuan Lake. And it's not a long portage. It's only about 700 meters or so, not quite a full kilometer. But there is a bit of a hill between the lakes that we've got to go over. And uh, you will be carrying your boat. <laughs> Sounds good. After some instructions from Scott on how to transport a canoe on your back, I finally figured it out. And pull it up. Like so. Okay? Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. And then up here, like that? Or yeah. well, just back just a bit? Gun wheel right here. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's pretty far back on my shoulders. Is that too far back? That might be a little far back, yeah. The, okay. I'm just trying to get the 
the, 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 the yoke in the right position here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that looks okay, I got it. I got it. All right. Okay, and balance. And balance. Okay, yeah. okay, Scott, I'm going to do this portage now. All right. So I'll see you on the other side yeah, at Lake Adjawan. Pilgrimage to Adjawan. Yeah, okay, I got it, Scott. Scott, I'm feeling balanced here. No, I'm feeling balanced. This is great. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. You get your canoe and I'll meet you there, okay? It took me a while to get used to carrying a canoe instead of having a canoe carrying me. After about 400 meters, I saw a sign and stopped to read it. On the top of it, there was a quote by Grey Owl. Far enough away to gain seclusion, yet within reach of those whose genuine interest prompts them to make the trip. Beaver Lodge extends a welcome to you if your heart is right. On the other side, I waited for Scott, who helped me to get into my canoe yep. for the last time. Now I was in the waters of Lake Adjuwan, the sanctuary of Canadian legend Grey Owl. Finally, I was close to Grey Owl's cabin. I had waited many years for this moment, and finally it was here. Before the trip began, I had decided on a ritual that I wanted to do when I reached Grey Owl's cabin. According to Indian traditions, smudging with an eagle feather is a way to pay honor and is a prayer to the Creator. I knew that this would please Grey Owl's spirit if I performed this ritual in his cabin. I knew that would happen sooner or later, but it's worth it. <laughs> Grey Owl's cabin. Buckskins walking in the forest so tall. Speaking to no one, watching the leaves as they fall. Checking in his traps for the beavers that died there today. Finding their babies, here's a voice start to say. And now here you stand in a ravaged land. It's a paradise all are meant to Black midnight forest, he's lifting his hands to the sky. His heart in his core and his eyes shining colder than steel. An owl is hooting, a man is learning.
stands on the lectern platform. His face is tired and warm. He's the voice of nature, speaking and sounding the call. Asking us to escape from the madness of it all. And now here we stand in a still ravaged land. It's a paradise all meant to share. Standing at Grey Owls, his wife Anna Hario, and their daughter Shirley Dawn's grave sites, I was thinking about Grey Owl's legacy. Although he wasn't a real born native Canadian, he was equal to one, if not more, in heart. He made Canada and the world realize that nature needs to be protected and worked all his life for this cause. He saved beavers, which he called little people, from extinction throughout all of Canada. I also thought that if he could only see the hundreds of beaver lodges today in the park, it would make him happy to know that his beloved animals made this park one of their favorite places to live in Saskatchewan. I stood there thinking about how much one man can do in his lifetime. But soon I heard a new song in the wind, and I knew it was time to wander on. 